from how the Aztecs or Mexica discovered the Great Pyramids of Teotihuacan, a group of scientists possibly finding a single cure for all cancers, something previously thought to be impossible, to the greatest debate of all time, is morality subjective? All this and more in the next hour. I've been working on this video for a month or so, and in that time I have found that I enjoy researching ancient history, and have bought quite a few books on several topics, so stay tuned for that. From Mesoamerica to ancient Greece, I will explore it all in documentary style. Check out my Instagram and Twitter at Book of Alice, and consider following me on those as a backup. And if you end up enjoying the video, subscribe to the channel for more. Thank you to our channel members who make contents like this possible. Members get access to early release videos, special updates, custom emojis, and more. If you want to support another way, consider subscribing or just binge watch this series and others I have up on the channel. Either way, thank you for watching. First religion was animism. Described as the earliest known religion, predating even large organized religions like Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, animism is described as the attribution of a soul to things like plants, inanimate objects like masks to a rock, and natural phenomena like a river or mountain. Believing in a supernatural power that has control over things and animates the universe. When European anthropologists began to study quote-unquote primitive religions, they studied the indigenous cultures of Australia, Africa, island nations, and the Americas, thinking that they were still stuck on levels 1 and 2 of the religious evolutionary stage, describing them as quote-unquote low races they took advantage. From this study, they hypothesized that our ancestors couldn't clearly distinguish between reality and dream, causing them to believe that their dead relatives were still alive somewhere else even after death because they saw them in a dream, basically describing their beliefs as childlike mistakes, confusing reality with the dreams they had. This ultimately helped to develop an early idea of souls and spirits in non-living things, according to anthropologist E.B. Tyler. He believed that religion started with animism. An example could be early humans believing volcanoes were spiritual beings, then evolved to polytheism, a belief in multiple gods like Hinduism, then to monotheism, the belief that there is only one god, an example being Islam, Judaism, and Christianity, though some people do argue that the trinity concept in Christianity excludes them from being monotheists. But that's besides the point. All this would lead to the pinnacle of human understanding through the use of science, basically our current evolutionary phase and quote-unquote religion according to Tyler. But of course, science isn't a religion, so I guess we transcended from that according to him. Instead of attributing all things in life to a creator, we use science to rationalize the universe. But of course, this was only his theory, and as time went on, scholars began to dispute his ideas, as they were backed by not-so-trustworthy sources. During the time he lived and conducted his study on these African, Australian, and American indigenous cultures, he used the sources on their religions that were tainted with Christian influence, meaning that the religions were not the same as they were thousands of years ago before first contact with Europeans. They had Christian elements mixed into their beliefs, or it had affected their original religious practices in one way or another. The data used was heavily flawed. For example, take the ancient Greeks. They used the science and math to create and explain the things around them, while at the same time being polytheistic, only one step above animism. And according to Tyler's theory, that would make the ancient Greeks a primitive culture, which is ridiculous considering they shaped modern mathematics and philosophy, amongst other things. We haven't been able to upload our consciousness onto the internet just yet, so whether we like it or not, we as mere human beings are prone to bodily injury. A while ago, one of my friends got into a car accident on their way home from work. They got rear-ended. I suggested hiring an attorney, but the idea intimidated them, worrying about wasting money and time. Here's something great for people in similar situation. Morgan & Morgan, today's sponsor, has modernized the injury law process, so you can submit a claim in 8 clicks or less, and communicate with your legal team all through your phone. 
and you only pay if they win. No upfront costs, sign up fees, or anything, etc. If you don't win your case, you pay nothing. As America's largest injury law firm, they have over 4,000 support staff available at all hours to help with your case. So you can submit case details, sign contracts, upload documents, and medical records all from your phone. You can even text your attorney and legal team throughout the duration of your case. Contacting a personal injury attorney should be your first step in a car accident. And a firm like Morgan & Morgan can quickly determine if you have a case. It's a no-brainer. So take action to protect your rights, and Morgan & Morgan will fight to get the compensation you deserve. If you're ever injured in an accident, you can submit a claim at www.forthepeople.com or by dialing pound law. That's pound of 529 on your phone. So go check them out in the links below, and thank you to Morgan & Morgan for sponsoring the video. Morality is subjective. Morality is described at its simplest form as principles used to distinguish between right and wrong behavior. So if you say that morality is subjective, it means that each individual comes up with their own morality influenced by their personal beliefs and feelings. Ultimately, there is no universal right and wrong according to this theory. It's all based on your opinion. The overall picture painted seems bleak at first, as most if not everything that we describe as quote unquote evil in a morality is objective world can be self-justified if you believe that morality is subjective. And this is a pretty dark subject to speak about once you consider all the horrific things human beings have done throughout history. But the question still stands and has been debated for a long time. Some argue that since science can prove things to be true or false, the same goes for morality. Things are inherently right or wrong, and it's set in stone like that in our brains, adding that there are core fundamental values that are shared amongst all cultures throughout time that never changed, though this can easily be disproven when considering certain cultures that have had or have core values that don't align with ours. Does that make our culture's morality objectively right, or are we in the wrong? Only one side can have the objective true set of core values, unless we live in a morally subjective world. Some also argue that morality derived from evolution, therefore it's objective, explaining that fairness and compassion are the founding values morality stands on. The reason we see these traits in the actions of chimpanzees, the closest living relatives of humans, alpha male chimps who show less empathy to other chimps are held accountable for their actions and their small societies. On the other hand, the alpha male chimps who tend to show more empathy to others are more favorable in their community. Empathy is also used by apes to topple the current standing alpha if they are the runner-up to the top. And of course, just like humans, they are shown to be more empathetic to apes in their circle than to outsiders. There was also an experiment published on the altruism of chimpanzees, where they asked the question, do chimps care about the welfare of others? They conducted this experiment by putting chimps side by side in different rooms and giving one of them access to green and red tokens with different exchanges. The red token was the selfish token and they could only exchange it for a single treat for themselves. The green token was the pro-social token and it could be exchanged for a single treat for themselves and a single treat for the chimp in the other room as well. Though it was expected that the chimp with access to the tokens could care less because because they would get a treat either way, more than 55% plus of the time, they would choose the green token, even if the other chimp didn't show interest for a treat at that moment. When the other chimp did show interest in wanting a treat to the token having chimp, the pro-social green token was chosen more than 65% of the time, but when the other chimp demanded a treat and began applying pressure to the token having chimp, the token having chimp chose the green token less often. Maybe it found the other chimp annoying or something. And finally, the token having chimp with no partner in the other room chose the green token about 45% of the time, showing that they do care about their fellow chimps' well-being. There's also the Capuchin Monkey Fairness Experiment, where two monkeys are given rewards for conducting the same amount of work, giving a token in exchange for a treat, though one treat is better than the other. One is given only cucumber, while the other is given a much yummier treat, a grape. The one monkey given the cucumber quickly notices that he is given the lesser of the two for the same amount of work. 
He gives a token and demands a grape by throwing the cucumber back at the person giving out the treats, attempting to escape the cage and reaching for the grape container, knowing he's being treated unfairly. Ultimately, research has found that monkeys show more empathy towards those they know than to others, a human trait, but these values are only the basics of what makes up morality. In human societies, morality becomes much more complex. Many believe that our human moral compass derives from a creator or creators, aka religion, as they find that religion is the only basis of what determines right and wrong. Who or what was Luca? Luca stands for Last Universal Common Ancestor and refers to the last common ancestor of all life on Earth, a microbe that lived 4 billion years ago, from which the three domains of life, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya derived from, including things like fungi, which belongs to a whole different kingdom of their own, separate from plants and animals. All different types of plants, trees, grass and hemp and whatnot, all the animals from humans to whales, all bacteria, Luca's basically all of our greatest grandfather or grandmother, making us all related. Luca is described as the simplest life form, possibly composed of only 355 genes, compared to humans who have between 20,000 to 25,000 genes. It lived near high temperature environments including hydrothermal vents on the ocean floor. Though there are still many aspects regarding this theory that are still up for debate amongst the scientists. Darwin was wrong. When people say Charles Darwin was wrong, they are attacking his theory of evolution by natural selection. His book, titled On the Origin of Species, published in 1859, explained that all living organisms went through the process of change, or evolved, over many generations by inheriting a variation of traits. Simply put, if an animal has specific traits that increase their chances of survival and have more babies, their babies will inherit those traits, which help them adapt to their environment, as opposed to animals with less adaptive traits. Many of them end up dying before passing them on to the next generation. Over a long enough time period, traits in a species that help them adapt to their environments better and live to reproduce will be more frequent in the population, causing the population as a whole to change, or as we know it, evolve. Though some creationists argue that, sure, Microevolution can occur within a species, for example, the way we breed different kinds of dogs. It is much different than macroevolution, on the other hand. The creation of an entirely new species through evolution. That's not possible, according to them. Arguing that dogs do go through microevolution and have a great contrast from a pug to a German shepherd, but they never turn into a completely different species, a non dog, despite going through evolutionary change, meaning dogs never turned into a giant panda due to breeding. They all remain the same kind, a term used by believers of this theory, though this concept of evolution is heavily flawed, as the term kind is often given a subjective meaning, depending on the person and their beliefs. For example, many compare African elephants and Asian elephants, believing that they are the same kind of animal, but yet they cannot interbreed due to their genetic differences. They are two different species. Another argument raised is that of irreducible complexity, stating that a given system in a cell with many moving parts which are required for its function would not function if even one of those parts were removed, ultimately meaning that it could not have evolved from a less complex system. It would have needed an already functioning blueprint of the system for it to work. All components would have needed to be made at the same time in relation to one another. This has even convinced some that there is an intelligent creator of the universe, citing the complexity of the bacterial flagellar motor that works, well, basically like an intelligently designed outboard motor, as some would put it, composed of multiple rings containing components like a drive shaft, a rotor, a stator, the FLIG that regulates the direction of the motor's rotation and determines the flagellar's swimming behavior, all of this powering a tail that functions like a propeller, moving the bacteria through its environment in order to find a nutrient working almost like a man-made machine. Instead, it's a nano-machine, all natural, 
Of course, from our point of view, if a car had no engine, it couldn't run. It would just be a body frame with wheels. Pretty useless. In order for it to run, it would need an engine for it to be a fully assembled car. The point being that the components of the bacterial flagellar motor couldn't have arisen out of evolution because they needed to be put together by an outside force in order to have a function. Otherwise, those components evolving alone in the cell would be useless. It's like building a bike frame before discovering what a wheel is. It would be impossible according to believers of this theory, arguing that there is a super intelligent creator behind it all becoming the leading argument in defense of intelligent design, though there are many that have already debunked this idea. Rig Veda The Rig Veda is considered to be one of the oldest collections of religious texts, full of hymns and philosophical ideas. It is estimated to have been composed between 1900 and 1200 BCE, though it is known to be older than that, as it is believed to have been passed down orally through generations before it was eventually written down. This scripture is only one of four that makes up something known as the Vedas, the first being the Rig Veda, the Samaveda, Yajurveda, and Atharvaveda, a collection of what we know to be history, mythology, poems, hymns, ritual instructions, and cures for different diseases, making the basis of what is understood as classical Hinduism. The Rig Veda is also the oldest surviving example of Sanskrit, an ancient Indo-European language arriving from India and the ancestor language of many northern Indian languages, though many argue the point that the earliest known physical copy of written Sanskrit we have found dates back to only 100 BCE. Before the Big Bang What was before the Big Bang? Probably nothing, and some think that asking that question is rather nonsensical. Comparing the question to asking, what is more south than the South Pole? Nothing, right? The question is impossible to answer, due to the fact that the concept of time as we know it began with the Big Bang itself. So how does one conceptualize the meaning of a before without the existence of time? It's hard and fun to imagine, right? The visible universe as we see it today was once tiny, very hot and dense, expanding or exploding as some refer to it, to create everything. This moment occurred 13.8 billion years ago. Recently, in just the last 50 years or so, scientists have known of the cosmic microwave background in our universe, referred to as fossil radiation. It's known as the shockwave that was released after the Big Bang happened, theorized to have created the first atoms in the universe. This fossil radiation caused the universe to be the color orange, or like a pale glowing orange, for millions of years because of the charged particles in space being several Several thousand degrees. It was too hot for even galaxies to form in that period. This cosmic microwave background, CMB, reveals the picture of a 400,000 year old universe, a very young picture of the universe that occurred soon after the Big Bang. Going further back than that, the universe begins to get hotter and hotter, as opposed to going further in time as the universe expands and cools. What occurred exactly before the expansion is currently unknown to science, but there are still some ideas that are proposed. We aren't completely in the dark. One theory put forth states that the source of the energy that caused the expansion of the universe derived from the strong nuclear force transitioning from one state into another. One out of the four known forces in our universe, those being electromagnetism, weak interaction, strong interaction, the one related to this theory, and gravitation, all of them merging to create a single force, a theory supported by experiments at CERN. You know that place where they have that large hadron collider. Before all of the known physical laws existed, that is what was before the Big Bang. So currently we cannot explain what exactly occurred before anything occurred. We're running into a wall again. And I just hate not getting an answer, but it seems so far that nobody knows. The question isn't logical or we can't conceive what it was before everything we know. Some believe that the universe was always existing but it was in another state always existing relative to how it was before the Big Bang, because it's theorized that time didn't exist as we understand it now before the Big Bang. Maybe another dimension exists that we may not understand just yet, beyond our understanding of space and time, and that could explain what existed before the Big Bang. Aztec Myths 
First, the preface. This explanation will have to be generalized somewhat for the iceberg's sake, but I am working on a single video alone, touching on Mesoamerican culture as a whole, so stay tuned for that on the channel. When one thinks of the Aztec civilization, the first things that come to mind seem to be pyramids, the calendar, and of course, human sacrifice. Let me clarify some things first before we get into the nitty gritty. What we know to be Aztecs were actually called the Mexica, or more precisely, the Tenochca Mexica, who lived in Tenochtitlan, in what is now present day Mexico City. The name Aztec didn't come until way later, around 1810, when Alexander von Humboldt used the name Aztec to describe the Mexica Empire, adapting the name from the Nahua word Aztlan, the name for their historical origin homeland. The Mexica were also only a part of a much larger group known as the Nahua who spoke Nahuatl. Words like chocolate, chili, chipotle, coyote, tomato, and avocado derive from this language and culture. The name Mexico derives from the name Mexica as well. The story is that they came from a place known as Atzlan, known to be somewhere in the southern United States and northern Mexico traveling southward or from somewhere so up for debate at the request of their god Huatzilopochtli to establish a new settlement. This is known because the Mexica language shares features with those of the Hopi and the Utes natives of the American Southwest. They are all part of the uto aztecan languages, which are theorized to have originated from here, the American Southwest. Early colonial books depict the people making the journey on foot. Huitzilopochtli, their god, then told them to look for an eagle resting on top of a cactus, a sign indicating the place to settle. This migration led them to the Valley of Mexico, where they found the city structures of Teotihuacan, which were already built and inhabited at one point in history between roughly 100 BC and 550 AD by the Teotihuacan people not the Mexica or Aztecs, not yet, until its final collapse of course, but during that time, it was one of the most populated cities on earth, filled with different types of people from around the area, like the Zapotecs and Mayans. They even had their own neighborhoods in the city. Think of it like a New York. They all coexisted in this one place with beautiful apartments. Yes, apartments with functional indoor plumbing for waste, roofless rooms for ventilation, decorated walls with beautiful art, and more. It wasn't only the pyramids they made. Teotihuacan was diverse and rich in multiple cultures, unlike the Aztec civilization who had a history of kings like Montezuma II, Teotihuacan left no traces of a single king in power, no royal burial or anything. There's even a lack of monuments that would suggest a king, leading to the conclusion that it may have been a ruling council instead, with the representatives from each culture that inhabited the city, explaining their peaceful coexistence with each other in the city. Soon after their mysterious gradual fading away, the Toltecs took over the region and began to conquer many kingdoms in Mesoamerica, ruling as far east as the Yucatan to as far north as southern Arizona. A great seven-year famine is theorized to have ended them though, and the region was rather empty and up for grabs at that later point in time when the Mexica finally arrived from the north, the Aztecs as some still call them, finding an eagle on top of a cactus on an island in Lake Texacoco, modern day Mexico City. This was to be the land to settle according to their mythology. This is where they built their powerful city Tenochtitlan, not to be confused with Teotihuacan. They were completely different places. They didn't build these pyramids as some mistakenly believe. They did build these structures though. Little of their ruins remain located in the heart of Mexico City as of now, because the Spanish and their allies Tlaxcala buried and destroyed most of their temples, though you can still find some remains like their Temple Mayor and more artifacts are still being unearthed today. Though the Mexica did not build Teotihuacan, they found it of great importance and revered it as the birthplace of the gods, translating to Teotihuacan in their language, so that's where the name comes from. The original name of the city is unknown. Now for their calendar. This massive thing was known as the sunstone, and it would have originally been painted. It wasn't colorless, painted to define certain areas on the stone. Now a lot of people believe this to be the Mayan calendar that predicted the end of time to be on the 21st of December 2012, but this is untrue. This was the Mayan calendar that ended in 2012 and started the craze. And also the Mayans didn't think that the world was going to end on that day either. It was simply the end of their calendar. It's not like it could go on forever. That whole end of the world concept was simply a fun Hollywood idea that they wanted to cash in on. 
the Mashika or Aztec calendar is still so fascinating nonetheless, and even explains their reasoning and practice of human sacrifice. You see, the center of the Aztec calendar is split in five eras, or the five suns as they thought of it. These four sections surrounding the sun god in the middle, the fifth sun, inside of those four boxes are the names of the past suns slash eras that once existed and how they ended. The first is death by jaguar, the second is death by heavy winds, the third is death by rains of fire, and fourth is death by water. And the last era slash sun, the one that we are in today, is death by earthquakes. Earthquakes are a common occurrence in Mexico, so it makes sense why they might have concluded with this. The myth is that the sun slash era that we are currently in was created by two gods, or several gods, who sacrificed themselves in Teotihuacan, the ancient city to them, and to us as well. The first god sacrificed himself to create the sun, and the second did it to set the sun in motion. And because the gods were so gracious enough to sacrifice themselves for the creation of the sun for the benefit of humans, the humans, the Aztecs, now had to keep on with the sacrifice of living beings as offerings to feed these gods, so they would continue to keep the sun alive and in motion. And it's interesting when you compare this to other cultures throughout history, like the ancient Carthage, who ruled the western Mediterranean, for example, who sacrificed their young to gods. Even the ancient Greeks participated in human sacrifice to appease Zeus on Mount Silicon, found in 2016, and their mythology often spoke of these rituals occurring, though they seem to have shifted to animal sacrifice at some point instead. This practice is even seen in many cultures throughout history all around the world, begging the question, why did this even become a thing that even in isolated cultures was still prominent? Is there an evolutionary explanation for this? Like even Christianity bases its faith on the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus dying on the cross for humanity. The concept parallels the Aztec myth in similar ways. I don't know. What do you guys think about this? Nihilism is truth. Nihilism in its simplest form is described as the rejection of all religious and moral principles, and the belief that life is meaningless. Though nihilism can be much more intricate than just believing in nothing to some, different positions exist in the matter. Many believe that all moral principles stand on nothing and cannot be objective. Even trying to attempt to find meaning in life is meaningless, because at the end of your life it would have all been for nothing from your own perspective. You'd just be dead. The most popular and understood concept of nihilism comes from Friedrich Nietzsche, describing in particular existential nihilism, encompassing all forms of nihilism, where life in its entirety has no meaning and no true value, despite humanity's attempts to find value in everything. According to Nietzsche, nihilism is described as the radical repudiation of value, meaning, and desirability. Repudiation means the rejection of an idea, therefore a nihilist would reject finding value in anything, reject finding meaning in anything, and they would desire nothing. A seeming opponent to nihilism would be religion, like Christianity for example, though that's not exactly true. Christianity gives you a road to take in life with defined morals and high unworldly values. It gives many people a meaning to life. It assures one that at the end of life, there is a heaven or hell, leaving people to question how they should conduct themselves in the eyes of God while here on earth, so they reach heaven. So in a life with no inherent meaning, it is the medicine to a person seeking comfort and direction. Though as science advanced throughout history, it challenged many religious beliefs and ideas. And it seems like Friedrich Nietzsche could foresee the death of Christianity in the West and was frightened by the idea of a totally godless society in the future. A world that had an almost infinite amount of questions with very few answers, as opposed to a religious society that presumed everything could be explained through God and the afterlife. All you had to do was seek the truth, the way it was for a long time. But even then, Nietzsche believed Christianity to also be a form of nihilism, as the earth is simply seen as a bridge to the afterlife for some, and not our only existence, because Christians believe they will spend an eternity with God. But while they are here on earth, many focus on seeking the higher values instead of the lower values that easily satisfy people while they're still alive in the flesh. Instead of finding this world's lower values as adequate enough and investing in this world, they invest in the next one to come. Therefore, Christians are also nihilists in Nietzsche's eyes, as they have a will that is opposed to life and seeks refuge in heaven. 
afterlife. Nietzsche believed that nihilism was the logical conclusion of Christianity. Christian dogma leads to many questions and theories. Because humans yearn for set values, all of that amounted to the age of scientific rationality in Europe, leading many to become skeptical of a heaven or hell concluding that all things learned through religion are merely objective, and that religious systems and ideals were simply a form of passive nihilism. Instead of depending on religious doctrine to base their values off of, an active nihilist destroys that foundation and takes that matter into their own hands, forming their own personal meaning and values in life. MR1 Protein and the Cure to All Cancers this one's mind-blowing, and proved that there may be one cure for all cancers in the near future. For the majority of cancer research history, experts believed that, that a single cure for all types of cancer was impossible, based on the assertion that cancer isn't just one disease, but more of an umbrella term for hundreds of them that affect people in unique ways. Take for instance the super effective immunotherapy drugs that have produced many positive results. They work well, but only for certain types of cancers, not most of them. This is where the MR1 protein comes in. Researchers at Cardiff University in Wales have found that they could use immune cells that go by the name of killer T cells to recognize the MR1 protein, a protein that is constant in the cells of the human population, finding that the MR1 could then be used as a universal target across all types of cancers, or at least most, allowing healthy cells to remain untouched, leaving the immune system to only kill the cancer cells. And this was all because somehow this new T cell receptor could differentiate between a healthy or a cancer cell through the MR1 molecule on the cancer's surface. It just knew it was cancer and began killing it. Here's a great diagram from Cardiff showing how it all occurs. So this is the cancer cell. The MR1 molecule is on the surface of the cancer cell. The new T cell receptor is then added to the T cell, allowing it to bind to the MR1 molecule on the surface. The killer T cell then attacks and the cancer cell then dies as the T cell goes along its way to patrol and kill other cancer cells. The astonishing thing about it all is that they came across this by accident when conducting research on ways to fight bacteria using killer T-cells, only utilizing a cancer cell as a host for the different types of bacteria that they aimed at killing. T-cells aren't only helpful in fighting infection though, they also carry the job of detecting and attacking cancer, so they weren't so surprised when they found one T-cell in particular that they were using, destroying not only bacteria, but also the cancer cell itself. They even tested its effects on cancer cells without bacteria in them, and it still killed the cancer, but they weren't impressed just yet. They questioned whether or not this T cell would be effective enough to kill other types of cancer, not just this particular cancer cell that they were working with that was prone to being infected with bacteria, as this was the main reason they were using it for the study, and so they decided to test the T cell against other types of cancer, like lung, skin, blood, colon, breast, bone, prostate, ovarian, kidney, and cervical cancer cells, discovering that yes, it indeed was effective in killing all these types of different cancers, a groundbreaking discovery in the field of cancer research. But would this work in humans? Well, they've only tested the therapy on mice so far, and have seen promising results. The mice that had human cancers that were injected with the T-cells, equipped with a new T-cell receptor that recognized cancers via the MR1 molecule, showed, as the Cardiff article put it, encouraging cancer clearing results. If this translates well to humans, it would be the world's first universal T-cell medicine for many cancers and would make the treatment more cost effective, not only financially but timely, as it would make it possible to start treating cancer patients faster, saving more lives. Though the most important concern before experimenting on humans is to ensure that the T-cell will only target cancer cells and not healthy ones, which would be bad, but more study on the T-cell receptor is still needed. Kalapa. This term refers to the smallest units of physical matter, smaller than even a single particle of dust, a term used in a Theravada, Buddhist phenomenology. Theravada being the name of Buddhism's oldest existing school, and phenomenology meaning the aspects and or experiences of a religion, in this case Buddhism, though some consider it to be more of a philosophy. Though Kalapa is not specifically mentioned in the earliest known Buddhist texts, it does appear in the Abhidhamatha. Sangaha, 
a Buddhist guide of traditions or instruction manual, speculated to have been written between the 8th century and the 12th century, so around the same time as the High Middle Ages in Europe, just for a comparison. The Abdhid Hamatha Sangha describes Kalapas as invisible under normal human circumstances, only becoming visible when under deep meditation, when one reaches the result of Samadhi through meditation. Samadhi is a state of consciousness, the final of eight elements or practices of the Noble Eightfold Path that eventually lead to Nirvana, the liberation of the painful cycle of rebirth known as Samsara. The examination and focus of Kalapas is a kind of vipassana practice used in modern Buddhist meditation that seeks to permit direct awareness of impermanence and non-self. Some believe that these mentioned Kalapas are what we now know to be atoms, as they are described in the writing similarly, though not exact, but once you reach a deep enough meditation, some describe seeing trillions of these Kalapas coming in and out of reality, performing a wave-like effect in their perspective helping one to understand the concept of anicca, meaning unstable, impermanent, and inconstant, relating to the Buddhist doctrine that all existence is temporary. And those were all the theories and or mysteries I have for you today. If you enjoyed the video, consider subscribing to the channel, and I'll catch you guys on the next video. Later.